Hey, fellow traveler, welcome to the Third Eye Awakening podcast, a show where we talk all about spiritual and psychic awakening, magic, the shift from 3D to 5D, star seeds, ascension, multiple timelines, multiple dimensions, the universe, the multiverse, the Akashic records, all the good things. I am your host, Amy Blair, and I'm so glad to have you here with me today. Okay, let's do this. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Third Eye Awakening. Today I have with me Christopher Goodrum of Soul Space fame. He is uh, one of the Soul Space family members and he's been posting some really, really cool things over the last few months. And I just can't wait to dive in with him and hear all about what's going on for him. Christopher is a teacher, an entertainer, a self-published writer with a deep interest in the paranormal. He is an oracle and soul reader with a focus on helping others along their earthbound and spiritual paths. Welcome, Christopher. Thank you so much for being here and sharing your Saturday morning with me. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to uh, finally speak with you. (laughs) So the posts on Soul Space that have really caught my eye is where you're really like receiving, I think it's receiving messages through dreams and synchronicities, right? Yes. Am I right about that? Seems to be, that seems to be how I'm getting messages through to me. Yeah. And you like really claimed for yourself that you're an oracle. And I just love that. And I support it so much because I know that like there, there comes a point on everybody's journey where they have to decide to claim it for themselves. And so I'm like, every time I read one of your posts, I'm like, yes, brother, get it. (laughs) Do it. This is your path. But you're also a teacher. I would just love to hear more about you, you know, kind of like who you are in the world and, and what you do and what your journey along this spiritual awakening path has been like so far. It's been, um, it's been incredible because once you start, you know, and I love the phrase going down the rabbit hole because I'm a, I'm a huge Alice of Wonderland fan. And I, I find, you know, there's a lot of metaphors in Alice of Wonderland that's really applicable to, to who we are and what we do. You know, so once we go down that rabbit hole, I find that um, things starts to um, accelerate pretty quickly. And what we try to do as, as, as humans is we try to make sense of everything. But, you know, Wonderland is one of those places where the more you try to make sense of things, the, the more crazy and confusing it gets. And so we have to accept that, that when we, when we do try to look into our spiritual side, that there's really no use trying to make sense logically you know what we're experiencing and seeing we just kind of have to go along for the ride and i've always felt that i had something specifically special about me and that almost everything that i've gone through in my life was kind of little hints and breadcrumbs that i can look back on and now i can see oh that is where it was leading and I've always been kind of a go with the flow kind of guy. I never thought too much about things. And so I end up in places, I would like to say almost by accident, but, you know, it's kind of like guiding me there because I haven't put too much thought into it. You know, I haven't been, you know, debating my decisions. I'm just kind of like, oh, look, there's a newspaper ad to, you know, uh, audition for a part in a theme park that's an hour and a half away. Okay, I'll go do that and it happens to be tomorrow. Okay. You know, and you're stumbling upon that by accident kind of thing. I've been thinking lately, I'm not even sure if I've been awakened. I think I've been awake this entire time. Yeah. And that yeah. I've just been finally fully activated. Ooh. And that's and that's and that's recent for me. The activation Aside from the uh, the Oracle experience that came through my dream, I think I finally realized and made a conscious decision to step onto that path. And I believe this was in August where I had a, uh, a tarot reading for an event. And the, the medium who did a tarot reading um, happened to be a friend of my wife. And I'm not really sure when they became friends, but now I've become friends with her. And while she was doing the reading, she was saying all these things that I already knew 
I was able to do. And I, and I told her this, I said, you know, I've always felt like I was able to do these things. And that was pretty much the point of validation for me to go ahead and start exploring more. And, and ever since then, it's like going from a 10 speed bike to a bullet train. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like it really sped up, eh? Yeah. And it's just, it's just been incredible. I can, I've always saw things a little bit differently, but I'm seeing things a little bit differently, even more. And I'm starting to realize some of the thoughts I've always had for many, many years are things that are actually, that are actually real. And the strange thing, th strange thing for me as a writer, especially in the science fiction and fantasy realm, is that a lot of the concepts that I thought were just imaginary creative concepts are actually things that uh, I've been hearing you and other people like John Edwards or the mediums or all those fantastic people on soul space they, they've been experiencing and been and be receiving uh, this knowledge as well and it really started got me thinking what else do I already know that I didn't know I already know right so like do you so do you mean that those concepts were already real to you but they came to you sort of and you, your brain understood them as interesting musings or imaginings for your writing and then you were like oh wait maybe this is actually a thing that people experience is it like that yeah it's it's almost as if and i've heard many other famous writers speak of this as well it's almost as if the stories you know when you create them or when they're being created you know they eventually take on a life of their own the characters kind of almost dictate how the story is going to be what they do what they say the story pretty much tells the writer what is needed i think a story sometimes is just a story but i think if there's enough energy and and creative magic that goes with the story it's almost as if you're manifesting the story to come to life and sometimes i think that writers may be tapping into a part of the meta consciousness where now they're not just creating the story they're pretty much retelling a story that already exists somewhere on a different dimensional plane. I think there still is a little bit of creative and fiction that goes into it. So it's almost like I'm writing this fantasy, I'm writing the science fiction, almost like based on a true story kind of thing. One story in particular, because I've heard a couple of people talk about this, this place called the void, this, what I believe is a dimensional void that allows you Kind of like a holding area or a waiting area before you slip into different dimensions i've created a short story a five of them actually and it's i actually call it the into the void series where there's five of them where there's two individuals in this black void and they don't know why they're there um, some of them if not all of them don't even remember who they are but they're they know they're waiting for a door to appear and these doors appear and reappear at random. And every time they try to go to a door, the door keeps its distance, so they can't go near it. The only time they can go near it is when a door appears and it finally opens. And they know that only one of them can go through that door, but they don't know where it goes. And so each story, the door leads to someplace different. So all of a sudden I started, I mean, I wrote this years ago, but now in the past few months, since I've been activated and accelerating on my spiritual uh, journey, I've been hearing people talking about finding themselves in a void, either it's black or it's white. And whether it's, they think it's a dream or through meditation, sometimes they're hearing a voice that comes through, sometimes another creature, probably for another dimension is in there. And so it got me thinking, well, if this is real, and I thought I made it up, when I, or I thought it, was a, it would be a cool concept to explore, what else have I been putting into my stories that might also be coming from the meta-consciousness? Mm -hmm, totally. And I, I had thought that, I think I was, while I was reading, I was sort of um, rereading Harry Potter with my son about seven years ago, I think, and re-listening to Game of Thrones series on audiobook. I had long drives, and so I would listen to it. So I was, like, in both of those works at the same time. 
And I really was like, I think this is a real, like these are, these stories are actually happening. Like these characters are real and this is a reality somewhere and they are both tapping into them because the, in just, I mean, those are just two examples, right? But like in a really well, well-written story, the details are so rich and textured and so consistent that you're like, this can't just be made up, totally made up because I don't know. I mean, like the, the human mind is not, it's clever, but it's, it doesn't have that level of consistency and clarity, I don't think. And like, it just seemed to me like they were tapping into other realms. So it's really interesting to hear you say that as a writer yourself, that you kind of feel like you, and, and I like what you said about there's still some creative, you know, like it, it's, it's like channeling or like a form of psychic mediumship, but it's not there is still creativity and it still has to be translated through the writer. And so, you know, it's not that they are copying the, like they're making an exact Xerox copy of a different dimension or a different timeline or whatever. It is being sort of like bent and reshaped and remolded through the writing process. But I believe that the raw materials that they're tapping into are actually playing themselves out somewhere. Yes, and, and I think there's a reason why there are certain stories that not just resonates with the individual, but resonates with a, with a culture, or it resonates that matches with someone's belief systems. Because if, they, if, been, if they've been standing the test of time, and I, I think there's something to it, there is, if we believe in the concept that if we focus our efforts and uh, with the with the good intentions, we can manifest pretty much whatever we want. It, it may not be uh, exactly what we want, but we can we can manifest. And so, if we're concentrating on manifesting, um, you know, trying to get a better job or you know, increasing our you know financial stability, I think there's two there's two parts to it. First, you know, you gotta you gotta put the intent out there, but also you have to also uh, be willing to work towards that too. You know, it's kind of like, you know, the religious belief that prayer without action is, is no good. So if you want to manifest something, you, you got to work towards that. And I think the universe will pick up the rest of the tab, whatever you're short on. Um, so with that, with that in mind, you know, if it takes that kind of effort and intention to create something, I, I do believe that, you know, writers, when they're really really focused on creating a story is that's i think it's that same kind of that energy that that goes out into the universe and and manifests itself somehow a lot of times i think when when writers are really invested in the story they're really creating something special and then then that's when kind of like the story you know kind of takes on a life of its own and it's it's from a writing perspective it's a really interesting process that you're that you're diving into but yeah I, I do think there's there's part of part of it that needs to be uh from the creative mind to kind of spice it up a little bit and you know make the stories a little bit more interesting but if we as writers are always been advised that uh, you know write what you know and you know we're doing the research and we're writing things so things are as realistic as possible i do think that when they're focusing and concentrating they're they're kind of doing like in a like a conscious meditation state in, in which i think information just kind of gets downloaded and pours right right into their fingertips and and helps create the story mm -hmm. that's that creative flow zone yeah sometimes they're in a zone it's like being in a trance sometimes yeah um when uh, i think it was last weekend when i was contemplating on on time it took a couple hours because for some reason i concentrate better when there's something familiar on the tv um <laughs> so I, I would be watching well technically not watching but you know listening and glancing up at like um, star wars or trek or ghost hunters or dead files or you know whatever 
something I've seen a thousand times, so I don't have to like pay attention. Sometimes when I just start writing, which something I've been advised to do in terms of journaling, just meditate, concentrate on something and let it flow. It, you do kind of get into a trance where you're just writing and writing and writing. And you just hope everything makes sense by the time you're done. Yeah, there is that zone you get into. Yeah. So interesting process. It is an interesting process. And I really, I really relate. Side note, that's how I used to um, study and write my papers when I was in university was having something that was very familiar on in the background. <laughs> Similarly, I couldn't concentrate, which I figured out was also a trick to accessing your like accessing your psychic abilities. So like if somebody sits down to listen to a guided meditation and, or, you know, they try to access the Akashic records or um, just, you know, the, the psychic energy field, which I think is probably all the Akashic records. I don't know. Anyways. And, and they feel like they can't, it's usually because there's the part of their mind that would be blocking them needs a task because it's blocking them. So they need to give it something, like either something to watch or like I find, this is very controversial and I don't know if I should be saying this on my podcast, but I'm gonna go ahead and say it. If I'm driving along safe country roads um, in the area that I live, it's very rural. So if I'm just driving, there's not a lot of other cars. I will go into a sort of a state of semi-hypnosis and where part of my brain is preoccupied with doing something with the task of driving. And the other part of my brain is now free to receive information and go into that flow zone. So I think it's the same like with creativity as, as well as accessing our psychic abilities because really those two things are not that dissimilar. I want to go back to what you said about feeling like actually you've been awake this whole time and that you just recently became activated. I would love to hear you talk more about your experience of that. I think that's so fascinating and like it just resonates with me so much when you said it. I was like, oh yeah, totally. So tell me about what it's been like for you. Well, now see... The great thing about hindsight being 2020 is that you can look back and you can make all those connections to things that happen in your life, things, aspects of your personality that, that are starting to make sense. Some of the, you know, for lack of a better term, some of the supernatural things that have happened to you that you can't really explain. There's little tiny instances. And in my mind, it's, it's a whirlwind trying to try to put all the pieces together and to try to remember everything. But like, for instance, I've always been, I don't know a lot about this subject, but I've always been fascinated with, with dragons and the fact that I've been getting more fascinated with them and getting messages that, you know, being a, a draconian starseed and really starts me to make me look back to how many connections there are to me, uh, to dragons. Not only have I actually written a kind of a comical sci-fi uh, fantasy story with dragons but i've also created a mythology of one of my sci-fi stories that actually involves uh, dragons as these higher being godlike creatures that for lack of a better term they they help in another galaxy elevate certain people to a higher level of evolution but anyway and before I even got a, a validation that I, I, I'm a draconian starseed, I actually had, for a few weeks prior to that, dragon tarot cards. One of my children was stillborn back in 2009, and my father-in-law purchased a, uh, a star, one of those star registry programs in his name. And it happens to be the star happens to be uh, just a little bit outside of the Draco constellation. I've always liked movies like, you know, Dragonheart and, uh, you know, just, just about any time there's a dragon, I, I just find them incredibly fascinating. Not only that, but certain random things like working at a place like a movie theater and I'm hungry and I just wish there was food and I'm cleaning up a movie theater and there's a whole un 
open package of nachos there, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> you know, just random things like that. Or I'm at the store and I just get this idea to pick up some apple butter and I get home and my wife was like, oh, I was just thinking about apple butter. And, you know, we hardly ever get apple butter. It's like incredibly rare, more rare than a blue moon. And <laughs> you know, it's just random things like that. I think, and I've been thinking about this for the past 24 hours, and I'm not even sure why, probably because this conversation was going to come up. When I was a, a very small child, I think I was two, there was an accident in which I ran into a corner of a wall, and I have that scar, obviously, uh, to this day, just right on my forehead, almost Harry Potterish, but not as cool. <laughs> and how I remember it is, at the time, I just had the one older sister and, and one older brother, and we got called to dinner. We run out of a room. We're racing. I'm not sure why we're racing. I remember being ahead of them because I've always been fast. I look back to see how far back they were, and I look forward, and I run into the corner of a wall. I don't remember anything after that. But the way my older sister tells it is that she pushed me, but I don't remember being pushed i remember looking back looking forward and being knocked unconscious she tells it a little bit differently now i'm not sure if this is a really i'm not sure if my perspective of how i see it now is is true perspective but i'm starting to get this feeling that there are two versions of the story because the incident happened in a multitude of different ways across different timelines and different dimensions. Mm. And maybe because of the incident, maybe I remember one version of it because I belonged on, a, not, maybe not belonged, but maybe I originated from a different timeline. And after the incident, I somehow quantum slipped to a, a different timeline. And so since this happened as a young age, I've always, I've always humored the idea of, you know, fantasizing about you know, either being a Jedi or being lost in Jurassic Park. You know, I've always acted out these scenarios just all by myself, just being this weird little kid all by myself, <laughs> pretending, you know, to live out all these fantasies on different worlds and flying a spaceship. I still literally have toys. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I have spaceships from Star Wars and Star Trek. And when I write stories, I have dog fights. I, I lock myself in my room. I play with the action figures. I still do that kind of stuff. I've always had this active imagination. And so I, I think probably somehow subconsciously at that moment, I, I was awake and I was able to experience all these things without knowing I'm experiencing these things. And similarly, I, th I think my two daughters were awake. Uh, well, I think everyone is awake when they're born. We just get programmed and we just forget stuff, right? Because children are so innocent and they're in that, I don't know if it's called an alpha wave where they're, they're able to see spirits, communicate and do all that stuff. But I don't think they've ever been put to sleep, so to speak. And I think it's because my wife and I have always been like encouraging them to be who they are. My youngest daughter, uh, she likes to go by the name Pluto. Uh, she's binary. She, she's she been getting into tarot and, and these things a lot longer than I have. And so she kind of reintroduced me to some of these things. So I think they've always been awake too and never put to sleep. And, and now they're kind of just starting to realize what they can do. And it's been interesting to watch them go through it as I'm going through it. Because now I have somebody who I can actually talk to that's kind of at the beginning stages as well. How old are your children? 19 and 16. Do they like talking to you about that stuff? They do. My oldest daughter, she's a little bit scared to talk about it because she, she knows there are things that she could do. She just doesn't know how to handle that. And, and my youngest is just confident in just knowing what she's doing. She's got uh, protections around her. She, she communicates with her spirit guides and, and, and gods all the time. 
and she acts i actually go to her for questions because she knows more than i do <laughs> and they're both old souls and uh, we've always been very close we do everything almost everything together uh, we like a lot of the same shows we like some of the same tv shows and interests and so our entire family is well entire immediate family is is just it's just very close and you're all like op openly on this journey of activation together well, I think it's just Pluto and I, my, my oldest, her name is Julie. She is, I mean, she's kind of interested, but there's something holding her back. And my wife, I don't think she's, I don't think she's completely interested. She knows there's things she can do. She's an empath. And so she can feel other people's stresses. She can feel other people's emotions. Oftentimes she's in a bad mood because there's someone near her that's in a bad mood. Mm. So she knows, she knows that she can do that. and. She knows when there's an energy vampire just kind of draining her. So I think she's just a little bit, I think she holds herself back as well because of what she can do. And I don't think she's, I don't think she's ready to walk down that path yet, but she is open to talking about these things. That's really nice. It's just, it's nice. And I think, I don't know, my perception of it is that it's kind of rare, but maybe it's not as rare as I think, but just to have like your whole immediate family be at least comfortable with it, you know, so that it's not, nobody's necessarily having to have like totally secret conversations. Like it's still a very personal journey, a personal unfolding, but it's really cool that you're all close and that you and your youngest are sort of on your own journeys, but in, in tandem with each other. My 16 year old is also, he's a super old soul and super awakened. And we talk about, we have some of the best conversations, <laughs> like talking to him is, yeah. So it's some of the best conversations I get to have. So it's, it's interesting how age really has nothing to do with it. Yeah. I mean, I, I open up to Pluto a lot. I, I hold a lot of things back from my wife. And, and, uh, you know, it kind of makes me wonder, you know, how much other people know when, you know, when they are sensitive or when they're psychic, how much they actually know and how much they actually tell you with the feeling that, you know, there's, there might be some things you're not ready to hear just yet. The, mm -hmm. um, the experience I posted about, you know, waking up in the middle of the night after having a dream about my stillborn son, uh, Jaden, and I just, I cried and I'm the type of person that not because I'm a typical male, but I, I just don't cry. I, I can, I can probably only remember four times when I've cried. And that was probably a week after he passed because I had to take down the crib. When the first time I've actually heard my daughters sing for an audience. And then when I woke up from that dream and I, I haven't shared that with her because I'm not sure if she handled that kind of that kind of news about what happened. Because I'm not sure if she's completely healed from it, so I don't I don't want her to, you know, get depressed and cry. But I think it's a message I should share. I just I just haven't done so yet. I just don't know how she'll handle it. So I mean, there are things that I think that I have to be cautious of when I when I read people and tell them what I what I think and what I know. There's a, there's a there's a great responsibility to what we do, and it's interesting to when you when you come across something of of where where that responsibility is and and what should you do to make sure you're not causing further harm when it comes to things that maybe somebody doesn't want to hear. Yeah, I agree that there is a there is a great responsibility and there is such a it's such a fine line to as you're talking about it, I feel like it's a message to share with her as well. But I understand that fine line of like not wanting to rock the boat, but knowing sometimes the boat needs to get rocked in order for it to change directions. 
but also sometimes it doesn't need to get rocked. And like, when is the right timing? And it's, it's a lot easier when people decide to like book an appointment with you. If you, you know, if you're an Oracle or a reader of any kind, when somebody books an appointment, you know that they're coming with their guard down usually, and they want to hear what comes through. And it's a, it's another kettle of fish because sometimes people have expectations and, you know, you, you hope you can live up to them, but you, you don't know. All you can do is relay what comes through, but it is different when you get information that you kind of feel compelled to share, but the person, like the person didn't formally book in with you or even ask for the information. And so you don't know how it will be received. And there's that element of surprise too, right? Yeah. You know, it's you, you kind of have to read between the lines sometimes because, you know, yeah, there, there are people who make a conscious effort to reach out. And then there are people who come across you and a conversation starts up by accident and then you just get this prompt. Yes. And you're kind of like, OK, I'm just a conduit. So a message needs to be said. So I, I need to say it. You know, you, you kind of have to put your human ego aside. Yes. And just and just realize you're being told this message for a reason. It needs to be said. It doesn't really matter. Well, I guess it kind of matters on the human level how it's received, but it's it's really not my choice to to have them like receive it or not receive it. It's it's what they do. I'm a big believer in free will. And so I need to get over the, the human tendency to withdraw and the human tendency to control things I can't control. <laughs> and it, and I'm, I'm learning a big lesson through going through this experience and, and through the shadow work of all the things I don't like about myself that's being re-brought up. And, and I need to learn to integrate it into my life so I can find a way to, to balance. So that's a long way of me saying that there, there was a time where I did a tarot reading just to practice because I'm still really, really new and there's still, I'm still fighting self-doubt, but I did a tarot reading on somebody and it happened to be one of my students because I was just kind of curious. I just picked somebody. And then the following day, she just happened to come up to me and just ask me questions. She just started telling me, she started telling me that she had a dream and I happened to be in it. And I said a phrase that I hardly ever say. I happened to say a phrase in the class and she goes, I just had a dream that you just said that. And then she told me about her dream. And then she told me about some other dreams. And I started getting these messages combined with the memory of a tarot reading I'd just done before. And I told her some of the things I had, I have learn through the tarot reading. I didn't tell her I did a tarot reading. I just told her some stuff because it just happened to flow with the conversation. And I knew it was a relatively safe place to do it where she wouldn't think I was crazy. But then she started asking me, how do I know all these things? And I said, I kind of don't want to get into that right now because once I open that door, <laughs> uh, we won't be able to shut it. So I'm not sure if you're ready to hear what I, how I know these things. But we, but, you know, she's come to me a couple of times since then because of some of the things I've, I've told her. One time she goes, Mr. Goodrum, how, when did you get so philosophical? <laughs> I, and I said, what do you mean? Remember that one time last year when we talked about time travel and, and alternate realities and I wrote on the whiteboard with a Sharpie by accident and took me a whole hour to wipe it off? She goes, oh, yeah. So there, I'm, I'm used, I'm known to being kind of a, a fun, hilarious kind of guy because I like so. <laughs> um, so my students rarely hear me say anything remotely serious or philosophical, but you know, when you get me in a very serious mood, I like these really deep conversations, but I also like to have fun and keep things lighthearted because uh, I get bored when I teach. So <laughs> I, I tell my students, you know, I don't say these jokes to entertain you. I say them to entertain me. I'm bored. <laughs> it's not for you. It's for me. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's for me. When you guys are quiet doing your work i'm i'm bored that's probably why i talk a lot i'm <laughs> bored so i need to have some fun <laughs> 
That's so interesting. And I'm thinking as you're talking about your your student coming up to you and like having that dream and asking you how you know all this stuff and just thinking like, God, aren't we in such a weird system that you have a role and there's these like professional expectations and it's the system, but it's also everyone's adherence to the system, right? So there's professional expectations that kind of make it so you can't really like, it's a, a boundary that can't be easily crossed. Um, right. Yeah. Right. That yeah. like, you're like, it's, it's not that it's like inappropriate as in harmful or anything. It's just that you, that's not the relationship that she has with you. She has a relationship, like you're her teacher. She's your student. She's not actually coming to you or she doesn't, that relationship is not built on her seeking that information. But then on the other hand, I'm like, wow, what a weird tangled web we're in where we can't just talk freely to each other because we have all these ideas of like what it means to be a teacher, what it means to be a student, what, it, you know, it's just so funny. <laughs> and yet, and yet the universe finds a way for connections to happen, yes. even, even in those environments. And so I always love those types of tangents. I don't like the tangents where I have a student who keeps asking me if I like bell peppers with cheese in them. But, and then people tell me I'm a robot. I got another person who said, you're an alien. And I went, yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> 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 and I said, aren't we all? So they look at me like I'm crazy, but I, I say it with a deadpan face. But the universe finds a way to to get those conversations to you because it's something you need to talk about or something they need to hear. And so, you know, of course, as a teacher, I always have to cover myself by not just talking about that particular thing, but then talk about other aspects of other, you know, I try to cover all religions at the same time. It's like, okay, if we're going to talk about Jesus, I'm going to say in the in the belief of this church or the history, if history perceives that. And then I talk about now, you know, when we talk about Buddha, you know, I kind of bring other things. So I don't get in trouble. Oh, he's talking about Jesus. No, I talked about other religions too. But like I said, the universe finds a way to make it happen because there, there, there's something that needs to be said and there's something that, that needs to be done. And you always, if you, and because I usually go with the flow on things, I firmly believe that if you go with the flow and don't think about it too much, you'll always end up landing where you need to be. And so for the longest time, I resisted the call to be a teacher because my, my wheelhouse happens to be entertainment because I like to have fun. I like to act. I like to write. I like to write music. That just seems to be my major creative talents, and that's what I've always leaned towards. So I've done community theater. I've worked at theme parks as an actor. And so, you know, I've only been teaching for, for five years, but I've always been told as a kid, you should be a teacher. You should be a teacher. But the funny thing is they, they usually tell me I should be a teacher because I was funny, which I never made that connection. You're funny. You should be a teacher. Like, what? <laughs> Despite the fact that I've always gotten good grades. But now that I'm a teacher, I'm realizing this is probably just another preparation for me spiritually because Maybe I'm not just supposed to be an educational teacher, but also kind of a spiritual mentor and teacher too. So I think the reason why I'm getting some of these questions, even from students, is to prepare me to think about things that they're bringing up to me. And even though I'm giving answers that I think I'm, 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 I'm being given on the spot, but also allows me to further contemplate. For instance, just yesterday, I have a creative writing class and one of my students was writing a story and it happened to be about dragons. He's a very strong writer for a 14-year-old, 13-year-old. and it's, it's a very good, clever story. And he asked, you know, what do you think happens when you kill a dragon? And I said, well, I mean, we can talk about this from a science fiction perspective or we can talk about this on probably if you believe in dragons maybe we could talk about this on a you know on a real world application but i started telling him things that i thought had happened when when dragons were being killed if they were being killed i'm not really sure you know if 
the whole lore of dragons and dragon slayers was an actual thing. I'm not sure how much of that was pure fiction and how some of that is probably partially true. But after that conversation, it really got me to thinking about what I had said. And I felt like a lot of what I said, if not all of what I said, was, was, was true. And so I started pondering that last night. I, I think that not only, of course, dragons are, are, are spiritual now, uh, just, like, just like unicorns, but I, I think when, when dragons left, we lost a large part of our belief in magic. And I don't think that was the first time it happened. I think when, when the unicorns ascended, we lost a, a tremendous amount of magic. Not that, we, not that this world doesn't still have magic. We still have magic. We are magic. You know, and there's still, from a paranormal perspective, there's still creatures out there that we have not been able to actually see with our eyes, but some equipment can find, you know, leprechauns or you know, what have you. But I, I think our human belief of magic shifted from magic is real t- to more of a fantasy perspective of magic. I, I, absolutely. I, I think I think dragons were probably the last of the major magical creatures that have left. And even after the fall of Atlantis and most of the dragons or majority of dragons ascended and some had stayed here, if we think back far enough to even our own legends dragon seems to be the last of the major creatures that were here during like medieval time or king arthur time and when they finally left it's almost as if we stopped believing in magic altogether and it just becomes urban legend and folklore and, and myth and so when i told him that that really got me thinking you know i should probably ponder this some more what what actually why did the unicorns leave what happened because of it why did dragons leave what happened become because of it in, in phoenixes? What happened to them? Why did they leave? Why did they ascend? And, and what effect it had on, on all of us as humans on this third dimensional plane? I have a question for you. Do you think that they ascended in their frequency or do you think that humans descended further into the like lower, denser 3D frequency? I think, I think both. I think that they were working to to help us ascend and we, we took a detour somewhere and so i i think our collectively as as humans i i think we just kind of diverged and became misaligned with with what the unicorns and dragons and, and phoenixes were here to do and so it was time for them to ascend and they're and they were supposed to and they were trying to help us, you know, ascend with them. And I think, I think we might have diverged. And so our frequencies just got further and further apart. While many of them went ahead and descended, some stayed behind, like the dragons, to help us further. And I think we just further and further started moving away from all of that. But now we're trying to find our way back. And I think for the most part, it's going to be a... a lower process but I, I think we're getting there but yeah I, I think that's probably what happened I think it's a, it's a little bit of both and I think maybe Atlantis may have been that tipping point hmm. of, of that advancement and then I'm still looking into Atlantis because I don't know much about it but I, I think we got a little bit too carried away with our own achievements I think we got a little egotistical. I think we got a little greedy on, on the power and and we just kind of shifted away, almost similar to the biblical story of the Tower of Babel. We just got so awe-inspired by our own success, our own pride, that we thought we were becoming gods. And then, you know, <laughs> we had to learn our lesson by having everyone just not speak the same languages. And because we couldn't speak the same language, we started to disperse around the world kind of thing. I yeah, think we- I, I heard it interpreted one way, which I thought was so interesting, that there was that the ba- the Tower of Babylon was created by our gods who in this interpretation, they were saying it was the Anunnaki and it was created to separate us all and like break up our coherent language and break us all into different groups that we could then feel like threatened 
by each other's differences. And I was like, oh, that kind of resonates somewhere. To what you're saying about the, the dragons and the unicorns and things, I it reminds me again of Game of Thrones, which is funny because it's not like I'm like I like I really enjoyed the books, not the series, not the TV series, but I really enjoyed the books a lot. But it's not, you know, I'm not obsessed with it, but it keeps coming up today for some reason. And in the books, everybody had thought that, you know, dragons were a thing of the past and that like to and that, you know, giants were a thing of the past and the children of the forest were a thing of the past. And so because like due to their absence, people didn't really believe in magic anymore. And I think yeah. that's what that's that's kind of what you're talking about is like it's not that they like you said, like we're still magic and there's still lots of magic here, but it's kind of it's kind of like without those really powerful creatures that are like totems of magic, really, really impressive beings we think that there is no magic but that's what also there there are those like creatures to some extent right like there's like spirit bears and like spirit moose like albino random weird albino you know of whatever species that just exists in the forest and to see them is like you know it's a big deal because they they carry this frequency of reminding us that like, Oh, there is magic. There is something, there is something special. Yeah. And, and it makes you, it makes you a believer again. Yes. And um, I heard probably the most profound thing I've ever heard anybody say, especially from <laughs> another student. One of the students likes to ask me a lot of random questions, just, just for fun. I, I used to thought it was annoying and then I'll just humor it and I just say weird stuff back. But, he started asking me, do I believe in this? And I started believing that. And then one time I turned the tables on him and I asked, do you believe in ghosts? And he says, you know, I don't know. And I asked him about something else. I don't remember what it was. And he goes, um, I don't know. And then I asked him about, I think I asked him about aliens. And then he eventually said, well, you know, if I believe in that, that means I, I would, that means I would have to believe in all the other things. And I said, that's probably the most profound thing I've ever heard. <laughs> if you believe in ghosts and if you believe in aliens, you kind of would also have to believe in all those other things that we just can't explain as well. Especially if you're thinking on a multi-dimensional plane where in other planets and other species and that, that could exist. So, you know, I used to, I mean... I think sometimes Bigfoot in the Yeti, it's a bit of a stretch, but, you know, there is, I guess, technically scientific proof with grainy photos and, you know, footprints and stuff. But, you know, he's right. If, if you believe in time travel, if you believe in quantum realities, if you believe in ghosts, spirits, and unicorns, dragons, and phoenixes, then you would also have to be open to the possibility of all these other things that people believe exist and you kind of have to go on on faith that they, they do exist somewhere somehow right somewhere. do you ever listen to the confessionals podcast no i i don't listen to podcasts very much i used to and then you know because of my journey now i'm now i'm searching for podcasts to listen to i listen to yours of course I'm one of those people that have to start from the beginning. So I'm still in like April of 2020. <laughs> I don't, I don't like to skip. I have a problem with skipping things. I don't know why, but, but I have been searching for other things to listen to. because I like to get other people's perspectives. I like to kind of see if people have the same thoughts that I do. Uh, but sometimes I think some of my thoughts are a little, little far fetched and I haven't been able to make sense of even my own thoughts. And so I kind of seen if, other people have the same ideas. And I usually find that when I have some thoughts, like two podcasts later, you would mention them like, oh, okay. That <laughs> so it's, um, so I'm still, I'm still looking for things. I'm, I'm more interested in podcasts where people talk about experiences oh. um, as, a, as, a, as opposed to, well, it's experiences and what they've learned as opposed to, I don't know. It's really, 
conspiracy stuff or I don't know. It's really hard to explain, but you know, some, sometimes you have to just find something that connects. Well, the reason I bring up the confessionals podcast, you might, you might really like it if that's the kind of podcast that you're more into is because the, the podcast host, Tony, he just talks to people about the various paranormal experiences that they've had. And that includes everything like, you know, either near death or like I literally died and then somehow came back to life experiences, experiences with like ghost experiences with weird things like hat man, like just weird, you know, they're not really ghosts. They're more like creepy creatures, aliens, Sasquatch, but like it runs the whole entire gamut giants. There's all kinds of things. Yeah. It's, it's a super, super interesting show. But all like it is like when you hear when you hear about something that somebody's experienced and you you believe them, then you kind of you do have to align yourself with believing in at least in the possibility of the other things. Right. Right. Which I think is why people draw their line in the sand. Like my dad, for instance, like he's got this firm line. He's like, Nope. Like, I just don't believe in any of that because he can see the all or nothingness of it. And so he just chooses like, okay, I believe in nothing. Like it's, I'm not, that's where I'm more comfortable. Although funnily, he's like a huge science fiction nerd. (laughs) So like he'll buy into it as long as it's just entertainment but he just does not belong, like believe that it exists off screen. It's very, very interesting. You know what? I think that all those people telling you when you were a kid that you should be a teacher, and that is a weird thing to say, like, you're so funny, you should be a teacher. I think that was like the, I don't know, your higher self, your spirit guides, whatever, being like, you should be a teacher, you should be a teacher. And I wonder if they were putting you or guiding you to this role because, it's it fulfills your soul mission without being your soul mission so i i wouldn't think that being a i'm assuming you're a high school teacher yes yeah i wouldn't necessarily think that being a high school teacher is is your soul mission i would think that your soul mission is to have these to to be an activator to be an oracle to be more of a teacher of like open-minded philosophical magical ideas and they just were like in order to fulfill that mission we're going to put you in the role of a high school teacher and you're going to have conversations that catalyze you know new directions for these students or activate them because they're probably all awake too but they're just being activated morsel by morsel right i mean because i mean we're here on this earth not to do i mean not to like our purpose is not to do like a a career for the sake of existing and being in that job. Yes. Um, uh, Our, 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 we are here for this, for the spiritual experience. And so what we are meant to do here is spiritual work. And, you know, we have these third dimensional careers and these jobs, you know, if we're aligned with our path to prepare us for that. And so I don't find myself to be a particularly good teacher. (laughs) <laughs> but you know i think the path that i that i walked and um you know i went to junior college i went for a bit and i wasn't really interested because i was more interested in entertaining people and so i went to do that and then i went back to college to get my master's um in business business administration and then i went back to school once i decided that this wasn't working i felt this urge to go back to school and decided to be a teacher and so I don't think any path you take is, is a mistake. You just, you chose it. And so you get whatever experience you need to get from it. And so because of the, the kind of teacher that I am, I can be fun and fancy free, but I get, I got this draconian authoritative temper sometimes when the world is just, when people are not doing what they're supposed to be doing because they don't understand their consequences down the line. I got to, I got to rein that in. So sometimes when the class gets a little bit too hectic, I, I write that in it's probably a little bit too forcefully sometimes. But I think all those experiences and me walking the path towards entertainment first gives me a different perspective. It becomes, and I become this different type of teacher that people 
often enjoy. Even after I scold them for like five minutes, they still really love me and appreciate me. Just to prepare me, I think, to, to offset that strictness that seems to run through my dragon blood um, to kind of temper the flame, so to speak. So walking that path towards entertainment first, I, I think, is, is what prepared me to be the teacher that I am now, which will later prepare me to do what my what my soul needs to do to help others here. I really, really love that. And I, I feel like it's such a, you know, like soul mission and soul purpose gets really confused. A lot of the time people think that it is like your soul mission is your career. But I like, I, I really like what you're saying. Like it's, it's hard to explain it because it's going to be unique for everybody. But I like that you're saying your, your draw and your motivation is towards entertainment first. And following that has led you to be in the place that you are now at, at every moment that is now in in sort of alignment with your soul mission, but it's not, it's, it's, again, like being yeah. a high school teacher is not your soul mission. It's, it's you just being you and you're, you are provided with these avenues to express your units and to connect with the souls that you're supposed to connect with and to, you know, bring those inherent qualities that you have of the, the dragon fire temper and the um, creative playfulness and the, you know, open-minded philosophy. Yeah. And, and I've, I've always had a temper and I've, and I've learned to control that to the point where to the point where a little too much the point where you know i often don't display emotions and um i find it hard to express and communicate because i always feel like i get ridiculed for having opinions and my emotions but you know while we're here we still you know the system that we live in you know we still have to survive we still need to feed ourselves we still need money to do things so you know we're we have to do these third dimensional jobs so we can survive and still live but you know if we didn't have any of that I feel that many of us would be doing our sole purpose. We would be activating each other, encouraging each other, because we wouldn't have these stressors in our lives that we, well, I have to spend eight hours a day working now because I need the money to feed my family, to stay alive, to get the clothes, to get the food, you know, to sustain myself. It just happens to be a physical, biological need to survive. And, yeah. and that leaves us that leaves us little free time to explore spiritually what we need to do or or why we fear you know it, from a catholic perspective god did not put us down on this earth to get a job <laughs> he's like you guys are freeloading on rent go down to earth and get a job no it's we're here to learn and to experience and to learn all the things we need to learn so we can return home and then we become you know, according to um, an offshoot, I'm not sure if the Catholic religion believe this. I used to be Catholic. I used to be an altar boy, but, but I also technically used to be uh, Mormon. Uh, they believe that when you ascend back home and learn all the lessons that you learned, you then become a God yourself because you come down here to learn how to be more like God. And Jesus Christ showed you the way of how to do that. And then when you return home, you're supposed to have all that. And then you can create planets and you essentially become a God too, because you're creating planets and you're creating life and all that stuff. So even from, from that religious perspective, you're not here to come down here and become a horse trainer or work at a school or pump gas. You're here to do spiritual work. You're here to learn from those experiences that can only happen here. And yes, sometimes that does involve pumping cast or getting to a car wreck or I mean well I guess I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that while we're here we're learning things that we need to learn and it happens in a way that that hopefully we can best learn it almost as if when the spirit guides give you a message it's in it's according to your reference point they know how to communicate to you so they communicate to you in a language you understand and if my message is wrapped up in a Star Wars reference, and that's how I'm going to get my message, 
that as long as I get that message, I'm good. Yeah. And, and also I, I agree with all of that. And I think like the material is not non-spiritual. Um, and that's why perspective is so important. And perspective is something that we have control over. So even if we're, you know, teaching or pumping gas or working as a midwife or, you know, working as a waitress, whatever, whatever thing that we do, because we have come to this place and there is a system in place and the system is like it's inefficient it is design we do exist here with within a system that prevents us from exploring the spiritual and yet the thing is that the spiritual is in every every molecule of the physical of the material the spiritual yes. and the magic is everywhere and you can be a student of it in every moment if you so choose but nobody you know <sighs> we have to choose that for ourselves and so and it's a moment by moment choice you know some moments i am very much in my oh. human 3d mm -hmm. perspective and i'm not noticing the depth and richness of the magic that is available to me all right. around me and but other moments i'm very very lucidly in the magic and i can you know be in this 3d material experience and be like wow this is like blowing my mind it's like a freaking psychedelic trip and I don't do psychedelics because I have a baby and <laughs> I'm nursing. So. <laughs> so it's just all, you know, it's all self-created by perspective. And I think perspective is something that we always have control over. And when we gain mastery over that, as we gain mastery over that, we, that's where the world really becomes our oyster. And also when we gain mastery over that, and we're no longer motivated by meeting the numbers on the paycheck. Like we, you know, we still, I'm not going to ever say that we don't need money because, you know, I just paid my rent the other day. Right. And, and like we, uh, we, we have bills to pay, but when you're motivated by something else, when you're, when you're motivated by mastery over your perspective and experiencing the magic and the spirituality that is, everywhere all the time then those things just flow with more ease and they can flow into our lives <laughs> differently because we are no longer like I don't know hyper focused on them and kind of strangling out the rest of the magic if that makes sense yeah and and I think what it is is that you know when we're here I mean there's already uh, there's already a fog when we when we come down here and, and i think that's the point you know when we design uh what i like to call our own uh, tapestry work when we when, when we become when we co-authored our design and we come down here and the main purpose is you know we we forget all of that because it's kind of like a test to see if we make the choices that we that we want to make to to complete what our purpose is and, and I think that's why I'm a big believer in, in free will, because I, I, I think well, in order to have those experiences and learn from things, you have to make mistakes. And so you need to forget certain things. If you knew what the right answers were, it wouldn't be a test. Right. And so when we come down here, we're walking in a fog and our what we're trying to do is clear out of the fog so we can see more clearly as to what we're supposed to do. And I think that's what our spiritual work is doing. But then the system, I like how, you know, when you go down the rabbit hole, you start picking up the vernaculars of, <laughs> start picking up the vocabulary of how everybody speaks. But when, but I think what the system does is that while you're walking in that fog, the system turns on the high beams mm. and you already can't see very well because you're in that fog. But now you've got these high beams that are kind of blinding you and getting you disoriented. And then you, you just kind of forget that you're trying to walk trying to walk out of the fog and into clearing and now you're just more focused into trying to get that light out of your eyes even if that means you're still in the fog i, I don't love know if that makes that. sense yeah yeah that's a perfect analogy i really like that that i feel like that's that's the perfect analogy is like the you're, yeah you're already in a fog when we come here we're already in a fog and there's a purpose for it and like you know we can bitch and moan about it all we want really but it, it offers us so much opportunity for growth and expansion and not to mention like the thrill of when you when you forget who you are 
and then you remember who you are, it's like, is there anything more satisfying or more thrilling? I don't think so. I don't think, I don't think any size of paycheck, I don't think any manifestation, anything is more thrilling than breaking through that fog on your own and remembering like, oh shit, this is who I am. This is who I am. It's like the most thrilling. And the the system does, it, it just like, it amplifies the fog. Yeah, oh. and when when miraculous things happen, you you do get that you do get that oh shit moment. You're like, I I don't know how it happened. It happened accidentally, so now I'm more interested. I accidentally time traveled, like maybe just a couple minutes, an hour, a few seconds into the future, as I was lying in bed. My wife was in bed watching a TV show on her on her phone. I think it was Victoria, the BBC show. And um, I remember waking up and hearing dialogue from at least two scenes. So I think I was awake for two minutes and then I went back to sleep. I woke up again. I'm not sure how long I was asleep. And the exact same dialogue was playing again, the exact two scenes. And I had this feeling and I tapped her on the shoulder. I go, did you already watch this episode? And she goes, no, I've never seen this episode before. And. I didn't even say, I I didn't even tell her what I experienced. I just went, oh, okay. (laughs) And then I went back to bed. But that entire time I was like, well, fuck, did I just, that is just time travel? Holy, holy shit. I'm getting all my cursing in now, by the way. I was like, oh my God, I, I, I kept, no, wait. Yeah, yeah, I did. And it's just one of those things we're so conditioned to doubt ourselves when weird things happen Yes, that we have to, we have to break away from that and just, and just believe. And once you start believing, then the floodgates open and all bunch of stuff starts to come through. Yeah. Which brings us back around to the beginning of our conversation where I was like, I just have been noticing your posts in soul space where you're really like choosing for yourself. They're like, I am an Oracle and sorry, I don't remember all of your posts. It's been such a stressful month for me, just a really busy month. But I just remember like every time I read them, I'm like, yes, like, yes, you are doing it. You are declaring this thing for yourself and you're, you know, you are overriding the self doubt. And that is the, that's the wall of programming that I think is maybe the hardest to get through is the, the programming around to, to doubt ourselves, but that's the necessary wall that we have to breach in order to, in order to see through the fog and, you know, and the, and seeing through the fog comes in glimpses. It's not like the fog parts, for most of us. And we're like, Oh, like forever. I remember exactly who I am. And I never have any other human ego based struggles ever again. That's not really how it goes, at least not right away anyways. But, but it's like, yeah, it's choosing to feel that moment of self doubt and then be like, no way. Like I'm believing this. Anyway, I just time traveled. I just had an experience where I like looped ahead and then looped back. Yeah, exactly. And I'm a big fan of time travel. So I, I think I have a good idea how it works. And, and that would let me contemplate, you know, a little bit on, on time. And, you know, what I think what it really comes down to is, you know, we self doubt so much. The proof has been there all along. And you get enough, those, those little doubts you plant way back, it just becomes an automatic default. Like if something you can't explain happens, you're just going to doubt it. But then the proof gets stronger and stronger. You know, I just told my wife this morning, sometimes spirit shouts because it's been talking to you for so long, you haven't heard it. And so now it needs to talk a little bit louder. And so it's when I time traveled or when I, when I saw that big giant eye that told me, you know, you're an Oracle and, and I see flashes of words in my head and or I see a flash of an alien language, which I'm not even sure what language it was, and I can't even describe it, and I can't even draw it, and I can't even remember it. It's like, 
these are new information, but some of the things that I should have known already to prepare me for where I am now was, was being given years and years and years ago. All these things you're interested in, all these things you believe in. If we just open our eyes to the magic and the miracles that happen in this world, we wouldn't be surprised when miracles happen because they're everywhere. Not just big ones, but also small ones. I remember, I wish my wife and I still had a photo. When my, when my eldest daughter, the 19-year-old Julie, I call her Rue. That's her nickname. When she was born, my sister-in-law was taking photos. And in a succession of photos, kind of like how paranormal investigators take a series of photos, one photo had this aura of light over my wife's stomach. And there was like these little spectrals and particles of light as well. It was the only picture in a succession of three or four that had this anomaly. And right away, we believe that was the full essence of my daughter entering this world before she physically came out. And I wish we still had that photo. Because every time we tell that story, I, I feel like I need to show it as proof. But I don't really need to show it as proof because I saw it, I experienced it. And so we've got to remember that we don't, we don't need physical proof. The experience is the proof. And we just got just to gotta embrace it. Because if you don't embrace it, you're missing out on a whole lot of other stuff that is happening. I couldn't agree more. It's and like the the tangible thing that is the proof doesn't it you know like even though you wish you still had that photograph, which what what an amazing story by the way, you you wish you still had that photograph. If you're relying on the photograph to be your proof, your evidence then you're distancing yourself from the feeling that you have right now. So because the photograph is not present, the f you're relying more on the feeling and that's what's more powerful or the memory or the knowing, you know, however you want to describe it, the embodied experience of like understanding what that photograph was showing. That yeah. I mean, if, if you're waiting for an angel to appear or Allah to appear or Shiva to appear yeah. or, you know, if you're waiting for them to stand in front of you, like, like Angel Gabriel said, hey, guess what? You're having a baby. I mean, then you're just going to be waiting for a phone call that's never going to ring. Because they don't need to appear. They're, they're already talking to you. And you don't need to see somebody to hear them. I mean, any blind person can tell you that. You don't need to see them to know they're there. Yeah. You just have to be open enough. To receive and, and be aware of what's happening. I feel like I'm, I'm, I feel like like during the day for some odd reason, I'm, I'm, I'm closed to everything. I don't know why I'm trying to, I'm trying to work on having myself open 24 seven, but I, and I think that's why the messages are coming through to me in my dreams. And I think that's why I wake up for some odd reason, um, anywhere between three and 5. AM where I'm consciously awake and then something flashes in my head because I'm closed during the day and I don't know why that is, hmm. but you know, if, so I'm working on being more open. We just need to be more open. We just need to see not with our eyes, but to see with our energy, see with our, our presence, our existence, our consciousness. It's, it's all wonder, there. It is all there. Exactly. It's not like it's just gone during the day, right? It's just, it, that's exactly, it's, it's your, your focus is shifted. And I wonder if it's just because of like, your job and your life as a as a teacher as a father as a husband and just you know a human being earthing i just think it's just you know i just think it's conditioned somehow from somebody maybe myself you know maybe something in past lives or maybe i know in this life i've always felt like i'm not able to share and communicate because i feel like every time i feel something it feels like i'm being told it's wrong or i shouldn't feel that way so I was like, <laughs> just the other day, I, I expressed a, an opinion in a meeting and I felt like that, that issue wasn't even addressed. It just felt like the conversation just turned back to 
where it needed to be. I'm like, but you didn't address my issue. So now I just feel invalidated and ignored. Oh. And, I've been, and I've been feeling that way. I've been feeling that way probably throughout my entire life. And so I think that's part of that being closed off. I've, I've, been, I've been given lessons every night because I've been asking for them every night to, to help me do what I need to do. And, and I said, I don't know. I don't care what the lesson is. Just let me know what lessons I can learn. And I remember one of my dreams is one of my old houses. I'm, I'm cleaning out a, a refrigerator. And I took that to mean that I need to, I need to clean out my fridge. I need to get rid of the things that are no longer useful to me. I need to get rid of the things that have expired. Right. <laughs> because, you know, you have, you have one moldy apple in that bag. They all go bad real fast. So I need to, I need to purge the things I don't need, but I also need to accept the things that I don't like that are in the fridge. I don't like cottage cheese, but if there's cottage cheese in my fridge and I can't get rid of it, but it's useful, I'm not sure what cottage cheese would be useful for, price baked potatoes maybe, um, <laughs> then I need to accept the fact that there's cottage cheese in my fridge and, and I, just, I just need to be able to live with it the best I can. <laughs> so, yeah rather than like always ignoring the container and it keeps getting funkier and moldier and funkier and moldier <laughs> yeah so you know it's it and and i i really like all the shadow work information i've been reading from other people is and i realize yeah you have to accept the good with the bad because without the bad if you want to you want to do a black and white scenario you know uh, nothing about you is essentially bad it's the choices you make and what you do with it but um you have to accept who you are completely. You have to be, you have to be able to live with yourself wholly. and what you don't like, you can change, but it doesn't mean you have to suppress. And I've been suppressing so much, you know, with my temper issue, my anger issues that I've learned to suppress as much as possible, but I also need to own it, not let it, not let it control me. You know, like you've said before in a podcast, not let it be controlled, but just acknowledge that it's there because if you don't acknowledge it's there, it's going to fester, it's going to boil, it's going to, it's going to overload and you can explode or it can damage your health, stressors, things like that. And so that's the kind of work I'm working on. And, and I think that's probably the primary reason why I can't do some of the things I want to do other than the fact that I'm not ready for it yet. And uh, sometimes the universe will tell you you're ready when you don't think you are. So you got to step into it, and own it first. But yeah, there's there's always there's always work to be done, and I'm I'm really looking forward to what I'm able to do and and how I can help others get there too. Yeah, there is always work to be done. I love your, I mean, like every day, right? Every day is, you know, I don't know. I feel like I feel self conscious when I'm going to say things like this because I feel like it sounds like such overused pity wisdom. But every day is infinitely deep and rich every moment is infinitely deep and rich with what it yields to us with the magic and those miracles the big miracles the small miracles the opportunities to to do that work of cleaning out the fridge and it, it can sound like such boring work but it's actually not it's separating I don't know. I mean, how good, like to really, really to use the, the 3d analogy, how great do we all feel when we've like actually cleaned out our fridge? Like really like taken everything out of the fridge, thrown away everything that we don't need, gotten rid of everything that is expired, clean the shelves, clean the racks. And our fridge is like all clean now and it smells good again. Like we just feel amazing. And yet there's no way to get there without cleaning out the fridge. And I think that's what really we're all collectively doing we, we have to do it individually in order for it to be happening collectively but that's what we're seeing play out in front of us and then you have more room to put things in there yeah exactly things you want things you, <laughs> things, you food. <laughs> things you just got from the grocery store like how am i gonna fit this block of cheese in there when there's no room oh i should get rid of the, of the other stuff so yeah i mean if you want to access the Akasha records, if you want to gain more insight and experiences about what your soul purpose is and, and activate 
you know, or manifest or you got to make room. But if you have all this, again, I don't want to say bad stuff, but if you have all that stuff in the fridge that you don't need, that expired, that's taken up room and it can spread, you need to get rid of it, dispose of it and, or, or give it away. You know, if you got something, you know, you're not going to eat, it's still good. Don't waste it. Give it to somebody else, you know, share that knowledge or, or, or give to charity or share, you know, just something as simple as generosity. You know, I have 10 bucks that I can go ahead and give somebody because they're hungry. You know, would that 10 bucks still be useful to you? Sure. Would those bag of apples still be useful to you? Sure. But you don't need it. So I'll give it to somebody else. Why just, why waste 10 bucks on something else? Why waste eight apples by throwing it in the trash? So you're, you're making room for new things, new things that you want, new things that you need. That reminds me, I should probably go, you know, the fridge. <laughs> right. I'm just thinking <laughs> as you're talking, I'm like thinking about when my husband brings home groceries and he just shoves them all in the fridge. Yeah. I'm like, wait, we have to clean it out first. Well, oh, I mean, because because here in the States, we, we just had like Thanksgiving like last last week. And so I'm like, there's probably stuff from Thanksgiving I need to get rid of. <laughs> <laughs> well, Christopher, this was such an amazing conversation. I know William enjoyed it too. He he, he has he has a lot to say. He, he has, has a lot to say. He, he's a very chatty little guy. He sometimes he really likes these conversations, and sometimes he's like, "Mom, are you done yet?" <laughs> it's like I agree with everything. I just would like a great. Can I just get a great? Yeah, right. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time on this Saturday. I hope that you have an amazing rest of your day. It was wonderful to hear about your experiences and your your activation and your journey. I enjoy it. I I really I really love these types of conversations because it really allows me to in the moment think through some of the things that have been rallying around in my head. And, you know, sometimes you have to say it out loud for it to make sense just to yourself. Oh, totally. Oh, absolutely. I'm a big believer in that. And like, if it's just hanging around, rattling around in your own head, it, it's the kind of stuff that can, you know, make you question your own sanity or it just amounts to nothing. But when you speak it out loud and share it with somebody else, then it becomes real. Yeah. And you're lucky because my metaphors usually get really, really weird. (laughs) <laughs> so I'm glad I was able to taper it down a bit. You, you kept your metaphors in like in a controlled zone. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thank you everybody for listening. You know, I love you. Thank you for the powerful currency of your attention. I hope that you have a beautiful holiday season and a beautiful day or night wherever you are. I love you so much and I'll catch you on the next episode. Thank you so much for being here with me on this episode. I appreciate you more than my words could ever say. Please remember to rate, review, subscribe, and share, and I will catch you on the next episode.